the second coin in the Heroes SD War Collection, Revolution is available now at SD Bullion. Available in BU and Proof versions, with an extremely limited mintage of 1776 numbered proofs, each honors one of the original signers of the Declaration of Independence. These stunning coins are once again sculpted by the world-renowned Heidi Wastwiet. Grab your Heroes Revolution coins today at SD Bullion. This is the Doc and Eric Dubin with the SD Weekly Metals and Markets. Joining us today is a special guest, a member of the, the silver and gold community, and uh, he's joined the Sprott team as the investment executive at Sprott Global Resource Investments. Um, we're pleased to welcome Tacoa Da Silva to the show. Pleasure to be here, guys. Thank you. So a little bit of a good timing here for Tacoa as um, he's in Vancouver this weekend at the Natural Resource Symposium at Sprott. So we're going to get to hear a bit of an update uh, from Tacoa on the ground at uh, the Sprott Symposium over in Vancouver. So we're excited to he hear about that as well, Tacoa. Well, we've had uh, quite the, the action in the, the metals here over the second half of the week after Really uh, a tight consolidation for the first half of the week and not much trading, not much action in the trading. Thursday, we had the big smash down in both gold and silver. Gold knocked back under 1,200, actually knocked under 1,290. Silver held above 20, but back under the 21 level. But we're recording this Friday afternoon after the, the New York close. And in the access markets um, in the afternoon here on Friday, uh, silver is putting in a, a nice move to the upside, back above 1250 actually, or 2050, actually uh, trading above 2075 right now, late afternoon on Friday. And gold also has just recovered uh, the 1300 level and is looking like it wants to uh, close around uh, 1310 here for the week. So what's your take, Eric? The takedown around another options expiration and then the strong recovery here to close out the week. Options expiration is next week, so it's actually a good thing that we're seeing the bounce back today. Uh, silver was getting pretty close to you know, slicing right through the 200-day moving average, and that would have uh, contributed to additional technical selling signals for the momentum trader community and on the hedge fund copycat um, you know, managers and computer bots that follow the initial push that comes with the cartel managing prices. So, you know, I mean, it's disappointing to see this thing happen over and over and over again, and we've certainly been here time and again. And earlier in the week, we had to go through the whole process of um, you know, Janet Yellen's um, you know, testimony. And, and it's, you know, these things are actually that was last week for memory serves so these these patterns happen over and over again and, and here we are with an options expiration being uh, one of the highest probability uh, periods of time windows where the cartel seeks to push prices down but the strength today and the inability really to keep prices down on a sustained basis suggests once again that this is just all a part and parcel of the managed retreat process we've been watching for months and that because the cartel and central banks in particular, but also private vaults um, and like the GLD's inventory of gold and you know, other private vaults, all having been looted for all intent and purposes last year aggressively to execute the price suppression in the face of unprecedented demand, all points to the fact that you know the cartel is going to have a lot more difficulty keeping the lid on prices going forward. So that whole managed retreat thesis that Bill Murphy always speaks about at Gata, I think is what we're witnessing. And we probably will not get over 24, testing 25 by the end of this month, but frankly, it's only going to be a matter of a couple of more weeks beyond the end of this month before that happens, if in fact the assessment is correct about the cartel having lesser ability to keep prices managed, and I think that's what we're seeing. With Dakoa on the show, I know um, a lot of our regular listeners and Silver Doctors readers, Tacoa, uh, also were big fans of uh, your blog site and uh, your podcasting site over at Bull Market Thinking. You put out a lot of really excellent interviews over the years. I'd like to give you an opportunity here to just to talk a little bit about your experience of joining the Sprott team, what it's been like kind of transitioning from a precious metals uh, news analysis and podcaster into a uh, an investment executive with Sprott, um, what it's been like to, to work professionally for Sprott, and um, just what your experience has been like over the past six months. 
Sure. Well, first, I want to thank you guys for the work that you put out there, and in particular, how kind you guys have been to me since day one in my interview creation and publishing work. Because when I first started, the only people who would be responsive and supportive uh, were the audience members. Uh, When I started out, uh, a lot of people wouldn't take my call, and that included IR representatives for many mining companies. And they're salespeople. They're supposed to take those calls. (laughs) Wow. So um, with with, with great fondness, I look upon your site and, and, and think about your audience as regular people just like me and you. But getting to your question there, how it's been so far with Sprott, I joined Sprott Global, uh, Rick's office over in Carlsbad uh, in February, and it's been just a, an exciting and amazing experience. I spent the first number of months learning about securities and regulations laws. How I got there was pretty exciting and amazing. Uh, I, I started out really from home uh, with my first interview, just calling somebody on the phone, and that person was nice enough to take my call, and then I kept calling and kept dialing, and, and people would talk to me, and it was and it was amazing, and I asked them questions that I, things that I cared about, just like you guys are doing, and then published the work, and, and other, and thankfully, some other people thought that, that the work was okay, and, and so they kept coming back, and so I kept going, but I wouldn't have been able to do that again had it not been for the audience members, the people listening, and the people coming back every day and supporting the website. And so that's so important. Um, and so I'm very grateful for that. And in terms of uh, wanting to uh, join Sprott Global Resource Investments and reaching out to Rick and, and wanting to join those guys, you know, as a as a publisher, I I came to this sort of realization after having done so many interviews, and I know you guys and and, and your audience are are well aware of this principle called Pareto's Law, which states that 80% of the utility in any given task is produced by 20% of the participants, no matter what industry or profession or job we're talking about, it's always the same. And the more exciting part of that is that you can take the top uh, 20% of the most productive people and apply Pareto's Law to it again multiple times to get the specific individuals that are responsible for the greatest uh, gains or uh, innovation or wealth creation and productivity. And so that's what the approach is to uh, finding investments and finding people to uh, invest in at Sprott. And I sort of came to that uh, conclusion also in my publishing work. I felt that within every industry there's a small handful of people that uh, produce the majority of the gains, the majority of the of the results and the productivity. So then I, I had early failures as an investor. And uh, you guys know this probably very well, that you can be right about the trend. You can be right about the direction of the market. But you can still get washed out, and you can still have your butt handed to you by the market if you uh, – don't cultivate the uh, portfolio management skills that you need to be able to uh, responsibly navigate that market. And so, you know, I let my ego or hubris get the best of me, uh, like other uh, most investors do. And a, a person can give up and stop trying and stop wanting to learn, or you can pick yourself up, dust yourself off, and then keep going and learn more and build yourself back up again to a a bigger and greater level. And so the process that I went through in experiencing that failure was that I said, you know what, there has to be a better way. These guys are doing it, and I want to learn how to do that too. And so I would study the bullion markets just like you guys do, gold and silver, and I would look around and say, who's doing the best? Who's making the most money? Who's living the kind of life that I want to live? And I concluded that it was these guys, these, these, these great mining operators Ross Beatty, Bob Quartermain, Rob McEwen, and others, that even in bear markets, they're, they're incredibly busy. They're really active. And that list also includes Rick Rule and Eric Sprott and Ned Goodman from over at Dundee. And, and, and I said, I've I got to get into these guys' heads. I've got to find out what strategies these guys are using. And so my thinking went from wanting to ask them what company they're investing in or why they're investing in such and such investment to tell me what this strategy is. Tell me what your philosophy is. Tell me what your habits are. Because if I can duplicate those things too and and continue to do them every day for the next 10 or 20 years or for the rest of my life, I can produce similar types of results. And so I came to the conclusion after having talked after having talked to those guys and doing the interviews that, you know what, if these guys are responsible for all the gains, why would, in the heck would you invest in anybody outside of these circles, these small groups of people? Why not just 
you know, make, uh, as someone asked me, uh, Tacoa, there's this really exciting company. It's got, you know, great prospects, a, a small mining company. Uh, what do you think about investing in that company? I said to the person, you know, I'm not sure that I trust that CEO. Uh, so I'm going to hold back. I'm not going to invest in that because I'd rather make a dime with someone I trust than a dollar with someone that I don't. And so that kind of summed it up for me where I said, why in the heck would you ever invest in any other company uh, outside of, uh, you know, one that you really, really trust where you, where you really know the people, even if it seemingly takes longer uh, to find those gains that, you know, we all dream about. And so not only did I want to continue this study of those people, follow them and find out what they're doing, what their strategies are, but I hope that one day, 10 or 20 years down the road, with some hard work, I might get the chance to be one of those people right, myself. And so that's when I reached out to Rick and, and, and the team there at Sprout, and they were kind enough to let me in there, and it's been exciting, and uh, uh, it's, it's been great. On a going forward basis, do you envision yourself as being more focused on investment management and things of that nature as opposed to... Uh, moving into further publishing and analytical work and interviewing people and so forth. Right. So the publishing work and doing the interviews has been, has, you know, I implied such a great learning experience, and I want to continue doing that, uh, not as much, but uh, occasionally as a means to, to to continue to share the knowledge from inside that organization with the public because it's so darn valuable. Um, okay. But uh, yeah, I'll be slowly migrating more and more into the investment management side of things and analyzing companies and, and hopefully I can pull that information over and you know share it with you guys and uh, other media groups. I know the um, investment community outside of Sprout would appreciate that because you've built up a, an audience over time that will miss you if you're not out there occasionally tossing a good article out for the public to read. So <laughs> keep a one toe in the water there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, again, the audience is is fantastic, and uh, I really want to continue working to um, um, uh, to be a servant, if you will. I read your interview with Mario Draghi, our wonderful ECB banker extraordinaire, former executive with the Goldman Sachs Group, and just wondering, how did that actually unfold? Did you just bump into him in a conference, or how did you manage to get some Mario to speak to? Right. Well, so I, uh, I was in Brazil about a year ago, and then I came back to Boston uh, to do a couple things, and I was sitting in, in, in Harvard University's library. Uh, for our people listening, I, I, I never completed a, a college degree, but through my experience with the publishing, I, I said, you know what, I want to be with the world's best. And for some reason, I went over there, and I was going to start registering for some classes, and I was sitting in the library. Uh, I picked up the Harvard Crimson, which is the school newspaper, and I opened it up, looked down, and it said, Mario Draghi, tomorrow night in the Harvard Kennedy Hall. And I said, wow, 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 what a coincidence. How great. The stars are aligned here. I'm going to go there and get them to talk about gold. And um, so that's so that's what I did. I you, you, I felt a little bit awkward and, and, and you know, um, sort of self-conscious because they, they a lot of these kids came from, you know, really uh, maybe elite families, if you will, and this kind of thing, and, and uh, everyone's kind of vying for space and, and, and pushing to get in there. But I said, I'm not going to let the opportunity pass or let any of these other people get ahead of me. And so I went in there and, and in my question, wanted to pose it in such a way that to, to brush off gold as not having very much value to sort of draw out from within maybe any 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 bullish or or any positive sentiment that he may have towards um towards the metal and it turned out that yeah he uh, <laughs> had something nice to say about that and it was, it was pretty interesting well so co wanted to give an uh, opportunity here to uh give our listeners uh, an update on the natural resource symposium going on right now in uh, vancouver as we're uh, lucky enough to to have you uh, we're recording this uh, show today friday um uh, Tako is joining us by phone uh, from the the conference in Vancouver. So, if you, just uh, for a minute or two, give our listeners uh, an update on the conference. Yeah, it is an incredible event. It's different than any conference I've ever been to, and the the positivity and the interest and the commitment of the attendees is uh, so much more intense than I've ever seen. Partly because of the fact that you know, many of them paid eight hundred dollars for a ticket to be there, and the who's who of the resource and precious metals development world has been here. 
Bob Quartermain, Ross Beatty, uh, Robert Friedland, Rick, of course, Doug Casey, and the Casey Research team, and lots of just uh, younger guys, the neck, the Casey Research's next ten uh, guys, and uh, all the all the great developers who don't necessarily jump into the spotlight and and, and are a bit less well known. They are the four percent of the world, the world's most productive 4% in terms of the resource industry and producing over 60% of the productivity. These guys are are hustling and scrambling harder than ever to secure deposits around the world and every resource you can imagine. And um, everyone's getting ready for the next upleg in the resource market. And it's exciting, exciting to watch because as your listeners probably know, over the past year or two, when you're looking at gold or silver mining companies, the big question has been, what's the grade? Uh, can the grade of the project be able to uh, withstand uh, compressing gold and silver prices? Uh, will the project be economic? Will the, will the company survive? So it's, it's been all about grade. But now, uh, every, a lot of people are thinking about, okay, with recovering gold and silver prices, let's talk about marginal companies, marginal deposits that don't, for example, a gold project that doesn't make money at 1300 but at 15 or 1600 might make a lot of money, or at $30, $35 silver might make a lot of money. And so you're looking at uh, institutions and, and large, very savvy investors looking at those types of companies and those projects, and uh, in a interview that I did with Eric last year, he talked about that strategy, and uh, Eric's brought, I should say, and uh, and I'm, I'm sure you guys follow that quite well. As we move back into the, the up leg, the next boom of the resource market, it's those companies that kind of look crappy today that do extremely, extremely well tomorrow. So it's, 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 it's exciting to see everyone vying for their position and, and you know, the jockeys getting on the horses and uh, getting really getting ready for the race. Are you hearing much buzz about um, new uh, interest from fund managers? Uh, you know, picking up the phone, calling Spot for advice, and you know, attending at conferences like the conference you're at now. You know, does it seem like there's a shift going on under, underneath the surface when it comes to possible new money? Saying, "Hey, reversion to the gold and silver is probable. Mine company shares have been suppressed or have sold off so much. Maybe they might not be aware of suppression, but in any event." Uh, what's your sense as far as what Wall Street and uh, traditional money management is thinking now? What, do you, what do you, insights can you see from your purchase spot? Well, I really don't see much from traditional Western money management groups. I don't really he- hear much about it, but what I do hear a lot about are the Asian groups. Uh, Sprott recently received a mandate from uh, some Asian groups to allocate uh, about $750 million dollars uh, over a set period of time. And so we're busier than ever before in terms of evaluating opportunities and putting cash to work, but surprisingly, it's, uh, it seems to be interest from the East more so than interest from, uh, you know, our uh, the kind of thing, what you would expect, the Wall Street hedge funds and the money management, the journalist right. funds, if you will. Those groups uh, will likely come in in the later stages, as the momentum traders will probably right. come in at, during during those you know euphoric moments. Are you free to say whether it's uh, Chinese money or just broadly spread across Asia that you're speaking about? And I ask because of the overall um, uh, attention that people are paying to Chinese nationals diversifying away from the dollar as well as the <laughs> nation itself. Yeah. Uh, so it's. Um, Zijin Mining, uh, and then uh, uh, a pension fund, um, but uh, that's all. That's all public information. Um, okay. So one can pull up the press releases there and get caught up on that. Well, that's actually a pretty decent se- segue to what's been going on in China as well. There's been a lot of uh, coverage in the mainstream media that loves to talk down about gold. That China's demand it seems to be slowing down because they cite the uh, reduction in Hong Kong uh, exports or you know, imports through China, through Hong Kong to China. And uh, in June, there were a reported 40-some-odd tons down from 52.6 tons uh, in May. And uh, I, I even warned about this a couple of shows back that we would continue to see these type of reports as we oscillate back and forth. I mean, the, the context being that even though there's a reduction 
uh, 40.5 metric tons in June is still a heck of a lot of gold, and that's quite a run rate on you know on an annualized basis. And I'm I'm curious, uh, you know, you, given the context that Straw has in Asia and whatnot, what's your sense about the ongoing sustainability of Chinese demand? Do you have an insight that you'd like to share with our audience? Well, uh, on the short term, specific consumption numbers. I can't really comment on those. I think, to me, it strikes me as just short-term noise. I think the long-term trend is your friend, and I, I think the fundamentals are intact, very, very much so. And I think that one of the things that I started saying after being a publisher for a while was this idea of, you know what, don't come and, 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 and constantly visit my work and don't spend too much time. Try not to watch the news too much. As a matter of fact, I don't really watch the news. I have some investment uh, news publications that I go to, but but that's it. And I think uh, most of that is just uh, short-term noise, and it could be distracting uh, to what one's real, true, ultimate aims are. And I think that should be on a daily basis is to work as hard as you possibly can and Save and invest. Save and invest constantly, um, and not and not and not be too bothered by the uh, commentators who might um, paint a negative picture uh, uh, on the on the on the short term metals numbers. Because longer term, the trend is intact. Switching gears a bit, uh, earlier this week we had news that the BRICS discussions about establishing development bank systems as alternatives to the IMF and World Bank Brent and Wood system. Uh, is moving along at a breakneck speed. Uh, we've had the BRICS conference in Brazil, and uh, as it stands, they've announced a hundred billion dollar plus bank that will uh, help to you know, stabilize currencies when there are ever currency crises, like back in 1997. Many of our audience members would remember that. Uh, and you know, the Asian economies at that time were beholden to the mercy of the financial system and the uh, lending from IMF and uh, you know, various ways in which to backstop what was then a pretty significant financial crisis. And now, uh, as the BRICS countries uh, together, comprising um, a you know, share of the global economy that's pretty close to the combined economy of the United States and the European Union, it's really no surprise to see um, the development of what's going on now with all of these alternative financial systems that in time will you know, put a great deal of pressure on the dollar-based system. So I was wondering if uh, you could comment a bit uh, about your perspective on where's the you know, dollar as a reserve status currency and as a trading status uh, currency going to be, say, you know, a year time forward or two, three years. Uh, I'm sure you have given that some thought and would love to know how you see that uh, evolution coming about. Sure. A lot changed for me after the experience of living in Brazil for a few years, and um, it really changed my perspective on uh, the economic and financial structure of the United States, uh, especially in comparison to other parts of the world. And I had traveled a bit, but I, I didn't actually live in another uh, economy as a as a as a as a complete full residence. One thing I'm reminded of in thinking about that question it was back in 2006. I had a condo and I was younger, and I started learning about what was going on with the deficit and and the the control that China, the power that they have in in terms of their treasury holdings. If they wanted to dump them and the the, the control that they could exert over our our, our interest rates, and so I said, "Wow, I got to sell this thing. I got to get the heck out before the crash occurs." And then a couple months later, I said, great, you know, slap my hands together and said, I'm out. Now I'm ready for the crash. And 2007 came, 2008 came. We didn't have a financial market crash, but that ultimate thing that I was waiting for, the sky-high interest rate, the end of the dollar, doomsday, <laughs> you know, all these guys, that never happened. And, um, and I started to be, feel that, that – that things take a long time. Change change takes a long time, but that isn't to say that there aren't tipping points. 
as Malcolm Gladwell talks about in his book, The Tipping Point, you know, when the glass of water tips over, everything looks fine for quite a while, and then all of a sudden you wake up and the entire world looks different. Not to say that we won't have a day like that in the financial markets or in you know, our, our economy. And if the world rejects the dollar, I really don't know, but I feel that over the long term, the dollar will become weaker and weaker and weaker, and the country will just age and become... Uh, sort of maybe decrepit when you look at our infrastructure system in the U.S. Many people can say that it's aging and decrepit, and I, I, I think that the dollar will age and uh, um, begin to fall apart, and not all at once, but slowly over time so as not to alarm the lobster in the boiling water. But at some point, uh, you know, the lobster will pass away and be ready to be eaten uh, by outside groups. So... I think I like the frog analogy better. At least the frog can jump. <laughs> the lobster's just frog dead meat. <laughs> but that lobster's tasty, though. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> and you can have a uh, surf and surf or surf and pond. A little lobster and a little yeah. frog legs. <laughs> but um, getting back to sort of my mantra of just save and invest and save and invest. I, you know, you guys know the direction that we're headed, and your audience uh, knows it as well. And uh, I, I feel like that's our best area that we have for control and and in terms of my own mind I, I i try to limit it as much as possible and thinking about these sort of unanswerable questions and wondering and curiosity is great but i i, I oftentimes would, would would come to a feeling of frustration in my in a, inability to control those things but again i could yeah. control my actions so that's sort of why what i try to defer to james kirk's always says that it's, it's always wise to just save real money and gold and silver are real money. We should probably just make a footnote about what's going on geopolitically. The situation around the world is continuing to get more intense. And frankly, the Western forces associated with what's going on in the Ukraine and the you know, framing of what's going on in the you know, U.S. media in particular, but in Europe as well, too, is pretty amazing when it comes to the mainstream messaging that people get, but in our community where people dig a little deeper and look to find the truth that isn't being reported, it's very clear that their interests within the Western community and NATO in particular that want to see uh, Russia ring-fenced, China ring-fenced as well, too, for various other means and methods, including the Trans-Pacific Partnership and excluding them temporarily as it stands until they acquiesce to our demands in terms of how that they will participate and whatnot. But the bottom line is that it looks like this summer is going to continue to see more conflict, and we've been warning about that in all of the shows, and unfortunately it's not getting any better, and the odds are that we're going to continue to see more turmoil around the world. So if there were no other reason to invest in gold and silver, that being the geopolitical events of our day demanding the wisdom of having an insurance position uh, is front and center now. I don't think uh, there needs to be much more to be said on that score. It's, it's just the, the, the fundamentals for gold and silver now, uh, with the exception of very marginal slowdowns in purchasing in China and other places, uh, remains very, very strong, and there will continue to be this battle between the paper pushers versus demand for physical metal. And during the course of the you know, more stronger seasonal period of buying right in front of us uh, and, and combining that with the geopolitical, there should be a continuing support for higher prices and gold and silver going forward. So, uh, Stackers of the world unite because you need your insurance against the craziness of the geopolitical. Yeah. Um, there's actually, a, a, if I could add a passage to that Please. Uh, that I spoke about in the last day or two, it's... Uh, from a book that I read recently called uh, Uranium Frenzy, Boom and Bust on the Colorado Plateau. It has to do with uranium, but uh, uh, the, the items in here really apply to any investor, I think, in the gold and silver markets. And uh, there is this man uh, named Floyd Audlum, who was an industrialist and uh, financier of the Great Depression era. And uh, if one wanted to look it up on page 25, oh, excuse me, 125, Floyd uh, noted that he said, I saw a strange situation. The public's confidence had dropped so much that the investment trusts were priced lower than the value of the stocks they owned. 
So for $5, you could buy a share of Trust X that owned securities of railroads and factories that were selling for $10 a share. It was a wonderful spot for someone with nerve and cash, end quote. So I thought that was a really interesting uh, comment that was in that book because there are various calculations that a person can use in determining a potential price for gold and silver, uh, you know, bar napkin kind of things when you compare it against the quantity of paper money units that are out there in the world. And the same thing could be applied towards the mining shares if one were to look at the value of the deposits and so forth. And I think having the idea of uh, being uh, willing to buy, being willing to be greedy when others are fear fearful, that's the formula that when you follow that again and again and again and again throughout your investing career and you don't sit at home all day and think about whether or not what you, whether or not you should do it, but 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 just do it. Uh, that's not an investment recommendation, by the way. <laughs> But um, just having the nerve to go ahead and do it, I think, is very rewarding. And I, I, I think uh, the, the precious metals, they look like very good um, uh, vehicles right now uh, for uh, the speculator out there, or for the person that's looking to build their insurance portfolio, as you mentioned, Eric. Yeah, and that's a great point, too, because if you map uh, the progression of the various QE programs and uh, other means by which the Fed has been injecting money into the system, uh, they pretty much match the price of gold over the course of the majority of this bull market. But then all of a sudden, about uh, 2011, if I remember correctly, the uh, relationship broke down. And you can see it very clearly, uh, graphically. I mean, it's, it's a very objective way of looking at this valuation of uh, gold vis-a-vis the credit that's been produced by the United States. Uh, and there will be a reversion to the mean, the consistency of that valuation of gold vis-a-vis the dollar nominal price uh, going up in price because of the debasement of the dollar will uh, definitely manifest, even though we still have a huge amount, trillions of dollars, in fact, sequestered on the Fed's balance sheet uh, you know, in holding of the deposits of the banking system. But that money will be outed over time. Even the process of the federal government being able to expand uh, its ever-increasing expenditures and our budget deficits is a transition, a, a transmission mechanism by which uh, that money does, in fact, enter into the system. It just heck, comes with a delay. All right. Well, I think that's a good place to wrap up here. Uh, we'll let you get back to uh, the conference, Tekoa. But uh, we really, uh, really appreciate your time. It was a pleasure having you. Guys, it's been great. Thank you for the opportunity. All right. So for the doc and Eric Dubin and uh, special guest Takoa Da Silva from the Sprott National Resource Symposium in Vancouver, thanks for tuning in to this week's SD Weekly Metals and Markets. Those individuals who are in charge of monetary policy around the world, I think they're very much aware of what is coming. When I've asked Federal Reserve Chairman in the committee about this, they never said, no, that's not going to happen. They use the word orderly. As long as it's orderly, it seems to be okay.